Udmi, now we can start. Huh? Okay. Hello. Yeah. Uh, so, have you started the live live streaming? Uh, Moina, get ready. Moina, you are ready. Moina. Moinak? I think yeah. Moinak said that we were live, so it's good. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, hello, I am Ulmi Ghosh. I'm a digital mineralogist at James Hutton University. Uh, I'm a digital mineralogist at James Hutton Institute, uh, UK, and uh, I'm the host of this session. So I'll introduce uh, Indrani Mukherjee. And uh, she is currently the lecturer and researcher at the University of New South Wales, Sydney. And today she will give her talk on unlocking the secrets of life's preservation on Earth, the hunt for biosignatures. So Indrani Mukherjee has always been fascinated with the fact that the transition of a simple cell to a complex one billions of years ago is the reason we share the planet with millions of species today. Her research focuses on what drove that biological transition. This approach involves an understanding of ancient marine environments via novel and cutting edge uh, geochemical techniques. So her research is a uh, questions, key concepts, and explores links between early Earth evolution, the origin of complex life, and formation of precious mineral deposits. She earned her BSc Honours and Masters in Geology at the University of Delhi. She completed her PhD at UTAS in 2018, where she worked as a lecturer and postdoctoral researcher in Earth Science until 2022. She then went to pursue the Roger E. Dean Fellowship at the University of Toronto. Currently, she is a lecturer and researcher in Earth Sciences at the University of New South Wales. So uh, without wasting much time, I would hand over the mic to her and she'll tell us more about her research and the presentation she has made for us today. So welcome to this session. Thank you, uh, Urmi, really appreciate the introduction. And thank you also for inviting me to uh, give you all a presentation and share my research. Uh, hopefully it will come across through my presentation that I, I really love what I do. And hopefully I can share that passion with all the students who are, um, and, and all the uh, guests listening with us today. Uh, thank you also for your time on a on a Saturday. Um, with that, I'll start progressing onto my slides. Um, I will first start by acknowledging the lands of the First Nations people where I am currently pursuing my scientific dreams. Um, the coronation in the United Kingdom today is a, is a stark reminder of the impacts of colonization in Australia and um, Yes, we're, I'm very lucky and, and privileged to be um, given permission to pursue my scientific uh, dream here in this country. So just wanted to, to acknowledge um, the First Nations people of Australia today before I begin my presentation. I thought before I shared my research journey, I, I would share a little bit about myself. I was asked to do that. Um, and you can ask me any questions that may be related to my uh, career journey so far. So uh, my upbringing um, was in India um, and I was sent to a boarding school in Missouri uh, where I spent 10 amazing years of my life. Uh, we were a very strong group of girls in my, in my batch and I had a fantastic uh, schooling when I was young and I owe that to my wonderful parents who had the vision to send me there on the first place. So very grateful to my old school um, for everything that I know in my life. Um, I then went on to University of Delhi. I hear some of uh, us here today, tonight are from uh, University of, of Delhi. Again, I had a fabulous time, um, grew my passion and love for geology at University of Delhi. I have to say I was not too sold for geology in my first year, I actually found it extremely, extremely 
boring, but that's because I had a health issue and I think I was very disinterested in my um, in the subject overall. But once I gained my health back, um, I suppose I, uh, you know, gained interest, but I owe my passion in geology to my economic geology teacher, Professor Mihid Dev. He was just a phenomenal, phenomenal teacher. And there was, you know, several others, but I was specifically drawn towards economic geology um, when I was doing my undergrads. And that's where it all started, my, my passion for geology. And I, I ever since then, I, I really, really enjoyed and still am deeply in love with the with the subject. I went on to do my PhD at the University of Tasmania, where I also did a, a few years of postdoctoral research. And you will see the bullet point, lots and lots and lots of challenges. Um, it's, it doesn't matter where we are in the world, of course, we will always face challenges. And um, it's been a, a, a very rewarding as well as challenging journey for me so far. I went off to University of Toronto, uh, having lived in Australia for almost uh, nine years, had to go um, change countries and uh, settle in, but only for a very short period of time before I got offered the position here at University of Sydney. Um, so uh, it's been a um, pretty, pretty exciting, but very tiring, exhausting um, and enriching experience for me so far. And uh, if uh, later on, uh, if you would be interested in knowing anything about my career, please do feel free to ask me any, any questions that you may like. Um, what do I love about geology? That we've had an incredible 4.56 billion years of history. Um, you and I uh, will not be able to unravel all of it in our in our lifetime, obviously. So we're all contributing, all geologists, I suppose, are contributing towards understanding or unpacking our very dynamic 4.56 billion years of history that's converted the planet to what you're seeing here on the on the screen to um, this. Uh, this is the planet we live in today. Um, and how did the planet look like 4.56 billion years ago and how that has evolved through time is, is, uh, is quite a spectacular journey and as geologists we are very privileged i suppose to literally travel back in time and understand this transformation um i have worked mainly on the chemistry of pyrite uh, pretty much the entire time but i've done different things with it i've uh, used the chemistry of pyrite to understand past ocean chemistry and atmospheric redox conditions i'm currently using i'll be talking about it in my presentation about using the um, geochemical information in pyrite to see if I can develop a tool to ascertain biogenicity or develop biosignatures. I've also used the chemistry of pyrite in economic geology, where um, we are using that information to explore for more uh, ZX zinc lead deposits and sedimentary copper uh, deposits. Um, more recently, I've also sort of changed a bit of my research direction and started looking at the same sort of information uh, to see if we if coal um, coal hosts any critical elements so but essentially i've uh, you know been very very involved with the chemistry of pyrite um things that i'm passionate about uh, currently and i have been so for a, for a few years now um being very passionate about scientific communication and more importantly, geoscientific communication. I really feel like we should all be doing our share in terms of geoscience communication. And I really invite you to think about how you can popularize geology um, for the future, because there's a, there's a huge problem currently. We all want to get to net zero and we will need a lot of uh, critical elements, resources, um, but because mining has such a negative perception in the media, the enrollments in geology in Australia and Canada and the UK have gone down drastically. Um, I'm not quite sure what the trend is in uh, in India as a whole, but we 
cannot afford to exclude geologists in our in our flight, fight for climate crisis. So we really need the numbers to go up, not down. And uh, why is it going down? Maybe we're not doing enough to change the negative perceptions that hang around geology. So I'm very uh, passionate about this uh, communication side of things because it will be really important in the in the next decade, especially if we want to get to net zero. And the other important thing, and I promise you, this is my last slide of uh, uh, you know things I like doing or passionate about, is the exclusion of women in science in general. I mean, we all know for a fact that in geology, it's definitely uh, the trend mimics itself and it's a very male dominated um, profession. I've got nothing against men. In fact, my mentors have all been men. Uh, what I am advocating for here is the opportunity should be equal to um, all members of the society and women account for 50 percent of the population anywhere you go if we are going to categorically exclude or not tap the talent from that 50 percent we're not going to make significant breakthroughs in our in our field of science so i'm um, i'm very very serious about this uh, particular issue that currently is in our in our society in pretty much every field but in geology it really echoes a lot and so Anything we can do in that's in our capacity, we should really uh, think about it. So detecting fingerprints of ancient life, um, jump straight into the talk. I think it's very timely that we start thinking about what the signs of life are and how do we recognize them? I mean, if it's a fossil in a rock, it's pretty straightforward. But when something was initially life form, but has been completely permineralized or replaced by another, another mineral where its original matter has been lost, but somehow there are bits that still remain. Is there a quantitative way or even a qualitative way of saying, yes, that is definitely um, was a life form. And so we can then say, yes, there was once a life form they're not there anymore, et cetera, et cetera. This is important because we're using our knowledge of Earth to look for life elsewhere. Earth is our only reference point. And my point is, if we don't understand Earth properly, then we will be very limited in our search for life elsewhere. So there really needs to be a considered effort on how we need to um, look for signs of life. But think about this we're looking for signs of life but we do we really know what life is like can can we define life it's uh it's not easy i mean in 1944 um erwin schrodinger tried to explain it from from a physics point of view um and we're in 2023 and we still can't agree on what the exact definition of of life is and I'm much like the seal that's being shown in this on this slide here. I'm absolutely, I don't know if I can define define life. It's it's a very, very complex, and I really urge you to read this article, What is Life? It goes through the complexities of how a scientist and different branches of science are just racking their brains, thinking how can we define it to exclude viruses, to not exclude viruses. It's it's fascinating. We can't even describe or agree with one another to define what life is. It's uh, quite quite puzzling to me that we're looking for signs of life on Mars. We're looking, we're trying to understand signs of life on Earth, early Earth, current Earth, present Earth, doesn't matter. But we, we still can't define it. So it's uh, um, quite interesting. But what we can do is, is to look for signs and uh, I suppose it will be a long time before we actually end up uh, coming up with a proper definition of, of life. But I think what we can do for now is at least try and um, ascertain um, what biosignatures are and um, how can we detect them. Uh, the problem is, like I said to you before, if it's a fossil that's beautifully preserved, such as in, in this slide here, then it's it's pretty 
pretty straightforward. Um, similarly, here, some beautifully three-dimensional preservation of, you know, cellular, we're talking cellular structure. So sometimes the preservation works out beautifully and it's very easy to say, yep, that's a life form that's being preserved, remineralized, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, but there are a couple of things that we, we need to understand because the terminologies, I mean, I go crazy sometimes just trying to understand these things. So there's biologically controlled mineralization and then there's biologically induced mineralization. And they're, they're two different things. Either way, uh, the biology is important, but sometimes because um, as a geochemist, I'm looking for geochemical signals, we have to be very careful about what kind of processes are actually resulting in that geochemical uh, signature, which is interpreted as being biosignature or not. So to give you an example, biologically controlled mineralization is a, is a more regulated process where an organism is you know, intentionally precipitating that mineral because it's serving some sort of uh, physiological function within the organism. So it's uh, very targeted. It can't just be any mineral. Um, so I'm showing you and giving you an example of magnetotactic bacteria here. Whereas there's biologically induced mineralization. If, if there's an organism and they will release some um, products, uh, their metabolic wastes, for instance, and depending on what other um, ions are present in the immediate vicinity of the organism, in the, in the aqueous uh, environment, you will form some minerals. Now, one is targeted um one is it's the same formation it's essentially the the thermodynamics of it everything remains the same but it's it's one is um 100 um sort of targeted mineralization whereas the other so in, in both cases for instance this these two examples you're forming magnetite but one is being formed when the organism is intentionally uh, precipitating magnetite within the confines of the uh, organism and the other is on the outside so these are secular um, magnetite that you see on the on the outside of it but what i'm saying is that this was serendipitous because there was iron hanging around and this happens to be um uh, um, uh, an organism or a, or a bacteria that basically reduces. So it will reduce anything that's around it, not necessarily magnetite. So we have to be careful about um, how these things formed and, and what processes cause the formation of those minerals. And once it's formed, and um, is, then it's the matter of preservation, right? So say whether it's biologically induced or control mineral has formed, um, once it's replaced the organism, the next thing is preservation. Um, because not everything that gets formed is preserved, as we know in Earth's history. But even there are different modes of preservation. So one is called permineralization, where you can, you know, I'm giving you an example here of a fossilized stem and the details of the structural preservation at a, at a cellular level is, is quite remarkable, isn't it? Um, Whereas autogenic mineralization is also a different kind of uh, fossilization or preservation, but it's um, it's mainly the the morphology that those you know subcellular intricate intricate uh, details may not be uh, preserved, and that's because in this case, uh, in case of permineralization, it's the early infiltration and permeation of tissues by mineral charged water whereas the next one is a product of activity of decay bacteria and i i know it sounds counterintuitive when i say decay bacteria but but believe me for orthogenic mineralization to occur you really need the decay process to provide the raw mineralized uh, materials for the mineralization so it's very interesting um but let's not get bogged down with uh, if, whether it's per mineralization or autogenic, we can always can spend years arguing arguing these things. Uh, I think the key thing, what, what I would be more interested in is regardless, um, if I picked a bit of this uh, image on the left here or the bit on the right where it's, uh, you know, those ammonites, can I say it was a life form? Because when it's preserved in its entirety, it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? But if a little bit of this pyritized ammonite broke off and got preserved somewhere else, will I ever be able to say, oh, actually, that's a broken part of an ammonite? 
So basically going into the nitty gritty of the geochemistry to see if these biosignatures are actually preserved, not just on the outside morphologically or texturally, but also in terms of its geochemical signals. Um, just uh, getting on, I've worked mainly on, on pyritization and a little bit of um, carbonates, but really per mineralize, uh, orthogenic mineralization, which is what we commonly observe, especially in case of pyrite, um, depends on a lot of things. So quickly running through those things. So the amount of decay, it's really, really important um, that we have some sort of decay uh, process going on just to start off um, the the various different chemical reactions that will be needed for the mineralization. Uh, I would also like to repeat here that in this case, DK does not outpace um, outpaces mineralization. So there is DK, but once it's uh, obviously outpaces mineralization, that's when you will not get anything preserved. It's uh, more measured uh, in this instance. Nature of the microbial activity. We, there's so much microbes and there's so much to be discovered. We don't even understand how much of microbes or microbial species there are on the planet, let alone their activities. But it is vitally important to understand what kind of uh, microbial activities are occurring during that decay. And then, of course, you need the different ions that form. In this case, you need, for instance, for pyrite, you will obviously need iron and sulfur. So the availability of mineral forming ions is very important. Precipitation is whether it's microbially induced or also lithification of microbes. Sorry if it sounds a bit weird, but when we look at these um, textures, these microfabrics, they are either uh, as a result of precipitation of the minerals, for instance, uh, pyrite, but sometimes they can be uh, a representation of the lithification of the microbes uh, themselves. And so if they are um, sometimes uh, the appetite precipitation or pyrite precipitation by a microbial colony is so high that the entire assemblage of the microbes is preserved. And so we, we need to see what kind of microfabric we are watching, whether it's a substrate or, or a, um, um, sort of a microbial. Uh, unit size of the crystal. So we know that the lower you go, um, the better the chances of the preservation potential of the, the various different structures within the cell. So for instance, appetite can you know, crystallize way below one micron. So uh, some of the intricate details of cellular structures tend to get preserved much better than, than pyrite whose crystal size is, is slightly higher. The, the lowest size is slightly higher than appetite, for instance, and also the rate at which the crystals form. That also matters on how much detail is being preserved. And then obviously taxonomic controls uh, will always play a role, won't it? Because an organism will have hard parts and will have soft parts and depending which part gets preserved and the environment of, of the organism in which it's being preserved is obviously super critical as well. Uh, so these are some of the, the controls on the orthogenic uh, mineralization. But yeah, look at this um, image here. I look at these, um, come across uh, images like that all the time. So this is like uh, sort of petrified uh, plant cells from uh, from Canada. When I was working there, we were working for a totally different reason on these samples and nothing to do with biosignatures. But you, that's the thing, you can come across these textures uh, even when you're not planning on. So what do you do with it, right? So that's what we're trying to understand here. Um, because these things um, that make up um, the the fossils or, or the microfossils, they are they are so small, but there's so much information within within them that it's um, definitely worth looking at it. So even though they might look very, you know, like what does this even look like, the image on the on the left here, but what they signify is 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 very important. So it's a matter of uh, sort of decoding. Um, the signs of life. And it's very important because we are trying to look for signs of life elsewhere. Um, so I've just shown you this image here. Um, 
I mean, what comes to mind when you come across something like this, for instance, in your samples, or something like that? It's pretty similar to the previous image I showed you. And what about something like the third image that I'm showing you? You'll be very surprised to learn that the first one is a photomicrograph showing alpha tracks emitted from radioactive zircons, right? The second one, I won't even try pronouncing that name because I have no idea how to pronounce it, but you know it's a fossil. We'll stick with that. Uh, but yeah, it's a fossil. But the first one had nothing to do with fossils. And here's a third one. Again, it's very chemical. There's no biological anywhere. So things might look very similar texturally. And we have used texture a lot in the past. And because it works, in, in, in a lot of cases, it's a dead giveaway. And there's no, no concern. But sometimes it can be misleading, right? So we really need to find additional ways. Uh, nothing to say that we have to ignore textures, but it's just finding that next, um, uh, next step to validate whether it's biological or not. And so these are called chemical gardens. If you get an opportunity, read the paper by McMahon. Um, it's, it's fascinating, that paper, because it comes, it actually really targets the fact that we will probably be getting samples back from Mars in about 10 years' time. And anything that looks biological, um, we will probably get very excited. But I think it, it sh we should be very careful about uh, what we come across in our rocks on Earth or Mars, regardless where, where the samples are from. So I've come across lots of I've worked on pyrites uh, extensively, as I've mentioned before, and I've come across lots of textures. Um, and just a few examples here. Quite often, I, I, I'm 100% I'm sure every time I publish these, I always have all these maybe of biological origins and I always have a question mark because I know the review is going to, you know, clamp onto me and say, what do you mean by genic? How, how can you be sure? So I always add a little question mark in my, uh, if I'm uh, publishing or presenting because I just, you just don't know, it could be anything. Um, so I started working on this um, a couple of years ago only, so very new to the game. I'm not an expert by any chance. Just thought I'd mention it up front. So the motivation was uh, from this paper by Marshall et al. in 2017. So they've used uh, Raman spectroscopy um, and they targeted uh, an element, vanadium. They wanted to look at the vanadium concentration. Quite often vanadium concentration is uh, associated with uh, organic matter and uh, organisms and their various proteins that the organisms utilize in their life forms. So the presence of vanadium uh, can be a good um, tool to basically ascertain biogenicity. That was, uh, that was really interesting, but I was thinking, well, why should we just look at one element? Because quite often we tend to get bogged down with a particular element um, like organic carbon. Is it an organic carbon or is it inorganic carbon? But carbon is, you know, used a lot. Oh, yes, well, if there's carbon, that must be organic. But but what if what if we looked at a range of things? Why do we have to just look at um, one? So, for, for instance, this is another really, really good paper, non-destructive in situ. Cellular scale mapping. So, again, they're looking for, um, for carbon here, basically. And so they think, oh, yes, that's, but, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious that this was it. so. This is from uh, the um, Rini uh, chert, and so um, it was. We knew it was a fossil, and so um, when we see evidence of carbon, we're like, "Oh, look, there's carbon in in a. We know that's a fossil, so we should be looking for signals of carbon." Um, but maybe carbon may not be uh, present in, in some of the fossils. Maybe the preservation potential was not good. And so what, what other elements can we look at is what I had in mind at the time I started working on this. So I decided to work on ammonites. I found a couple of laser mounts. There was no scarcity of laser mounts in 
from where I was doing my PhD, I tell you. So I thought, oh, well, let's have a look at these. What, what are they saying? So we wanted to do some uh, textural, um, you know, the excitement of looking at samples under, under the microscope is obviously um, pretty amazing. But the microscope can only get that far, right? So you have to um, sort of um, take... Uh, you know, take it to the next level by using the scanning electron microscope. And I'm sure these days there are all kinds of things for high resolution photography. Um, so yeah, we did some SEM work. We did some backscattered electron uh, imaging to see if uh, we could further see any differences in textures. Is there any changes and are there any changes in the crystal structure, size, orientation? Lots of things you can do. And then of course we wanted to um see what the um, geochemical composition looked like so we did some mapping of the various different elements we did spot analysis and then i collaborated with a statistician uh and we uh well he used the software r to see if we can use the geochemical composition uh to to basically uh, see if we can differentiate between what's biological and what's not biological. So what did we want to look at? We wanted to look at a suite of, of trace elements. So just, just giving you a quick refresher on what elements are really required by life. Of course, we need the, the basic major elements and then we need a lot of trace elements. And, and really trace elements to me, they're absolutely fascinating. Of the um, 30... 30 odd uh, elements required for every life form, 19 of them are trace. Um, so it's really, really important we understand um, the importance and significance of, of trace elements. So if, if they're that essential for a life form, perhaps if we if we look for them, uh, then that will be, uh, can be used as a biosignature because they're, they're required in this critical amount. You can't have too much of them. You can't have too little of them. So given their importance in life and, you know, running metabolic reactivities and, and activities, I, given it's so important, it would be, I just thought it would be easier for me to uh, see if we can use the variation or variability of trace elements to see whether we can delineate what's life and what's not. Um this is something I came across, um, which validates um, my point about using trace elements, is that it's currently being done. Now, I'm sure the title of the paper will tell you I have absolutely zero skin in the, in the game. I am not a doctor whatsoever. But I came across this paper because I thought it was absolutely fascinating. So we are currently using, if you read the paper, you, you'll see, same techniques that geologists uh, use, by the way. So XRF using the nano XRF. So you go out really low levels. I mean, we're at a cellular level here, and this is of a um, um, this is of a, a sort of a neuron body or, or whatever. But that's not the. Let's not get carried away in the nitty gritty of what it is. But what's happening is that they currently use the concentration of certain elements. In this case, phosphorus and sulfur in brain tissues or any tissue, for instance, to delineate the different cellular boundaries. Or in this case, uh, we're looking at the nucleus and nucleolus and um, the cytoplasm and the neuropil. Doesn't matter what they are, but we are currently using this technique to delineate the different. So there's obviously a link between the cellular requirements of trace elements because they're getting concentrated in certain areas of the cell. So there's obviously a demand for it. There's a need for it. And, and because there is a need for it, and we're, we're looking at these different concentration gradients, they're now being used to, you know, this is being used to see what's causing Parkinson's disease. But in our case, I'm thinking, well, if certain areas of an organism will um, attract or um, sort of supersaturate or, um, yeah, basically cause the formation or uh, and, and uh, sort of um, uh, compilation of elements, then then maybe we could 
look for similar signatures in our older rocks to to delineate that what must be life uh, must have been a life form before or not but but having said that i've looked at uh, trace element maps uh, where you can see similar concentration on the outside of a grain versus inside of a grain grain that has got nothing to do with um, biology whatsoever so it's not a sensu stricto sort of biological process only but um it's one of the considerations um and you know certain elements are specifically uh, sort of being targeted um in this case in a, in a lot of other cases as well so maybe we could tap into that uh, knowledge base so my samples just quickly are from the blue layers formations um in england um two laser mounts and we did lots of uh, backscattered electron images just to see some sort of textural um sort of variation so this image on the left here is basically this little ammonite here um, and so if you zoom in um you start to see some really interesting pictures so um yeah very different so this is all pyrite uh, these coarser crystals are also pyrite, which is obviously precipitated in that hollow part of the ammonite. But these are some of the primary fabric that still uh, we believe is, is preserved. Um, some more examples of the textures. Um, here we go again with some more textural um, images. This is the, the, the other ammonite, that's the carbonate. We see some sort of variation again they're all carbonates but you 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 can see some variation like i said you can do band contrast to see if they have different diffraction patterns and if the crystal orientations are are slightly different that can be uh you know we uh, our collaborator wanted to do some inverse pole figures and just to see what the um orientation of the individual crystals were um but I was more interested in the in the geochemical composition. So we did lots of images and we also did spot analysis. So here are some data on the spot analysis. So we analyzed the pyrite that was completely, you know, the bio, biological parts of the um, ammonites and then normal pyrite that was present in the matrix um, just to see what the difference was. And, and so the fossil pyrite always almost had lower trace element concentration than the, uh, you know, the matrix, matrix pyrite. Uh, in terms of rare earth analysis, I'm, I'm just showing you a few here. Um, in this case, it was not so much the, the biological and non-biological, there were different worlds. Um, so we just did inner to outer just to see if there's a difference of any sort. And so, yeah, we saw lots of, uh, you know, high concentration of trace elements in the inner world compared to the middle and outer one so there's some so that tells me that okay something is going on in terms of it's not homogeneous uh, whether it's the pyrite trace elements or the carbonate uh, elements something is obviously you know different so look at the tra laser generated images again the beautiful images you get not just for one element for a lot of them um this is um, once we imaged, we thought, well, we better run the the stats. And we were just talking about machine learning with Ulmi. So I'd like to know your thoughts on that, Ulmi, later on. If you have any uh, suggestions for me, that would be really good. Um, so what we did was, like I said, uh, do some laser maps. In this case, we've mapped this particular area here. And then um, we've selected regions. Uh, we, we think here's where the you know, primary texture seems to have been preserved. This is just the hollow part of the, you know, coarse uh, grains of pyrite. And this is just the outer part of the pyrite. And so we've collected um, point data from, from this image. So when you image um, or analyze for geochemical composition across, across an image, it will collect all the uh, geochemical data for each and every point on that image so you can you know uh, the softwares these days can do anything essentially so they've collected all the point data from the different paths that we've assigned um, and and they were calculated for for clustering 
So um, the data for each element were examined for, for clustering using R. So we wanted to see if there's clustering because like I mentioned to you before, we were thinking that if it's a biologically controlled mineralization, then um, is, is there some sort of, um, you know, sort of targeted mineralization? And if that's the case, then that will probably have a unique trace element signature compared to the rest of it. Um, so that was the plan. And the other thing I should have mentioned before is that orthogenic mineralization takes place um, when it's when it's well done. Uh, so a good environment of, of preservation as well as mineralization would be when the item of decay is um, a, a, a sort of isolated environment. So they kind of create their own little micro environments where the cell uh, or the organism is being replaced. And so that is because it's a micro environment, it is quite likely that it will have its own sort of chemical signature compared to the rest of it. Um, so we wanted to see if there is some sort of clustering in certain parts of the fossil uh, or the ammonite as a whole to, to see if that corresponds with the biological areas. Um, uh, because, you know, really what we want to see is if elements are being concentrated uh, because of biological processes. And when an organism dies, the, the body of the organism is, becomes a substrate and it's decay. You know, there's lots of trace elements that will have gone in uh, the, the organism for its survival. When it decays, it probably releases some of them and it probably gets reconcentrated back again when the mineralization occurs. So for instance, the various different trace elements that we're looking at may have uh, been released by the organisms or maybe around in the vicinity, but when the autogenic mineralization is occurring, for instance, pyritization, it gets, it's getting incorporated within uh, the particular um, mineral in the biological zone compared to where elsewhere it's forming. So it's trace element, what I'm saying is the content can can be quite uh, indicative of those things. And we wanted to see if clustering was a good tool to delineate that. And um, yeah, we this is a very weird way of showing you, of course. So uh, just going back to the slide before, where we saw the values exceed the 95% confidence um, level, that's when we thought that it was, you know, indeed significant clustering and that maybe but we didn't know that whether that was biological or not. So we just tried to relate, correlate it back with our textures and it worked out, worked out pretty well. So here's the image I showed you. And so if you looked at cobalt and nickel, you get, you know, really good um, clustering, high clustering values in the biological bits. So these bits here, uh, let me see if I can get the laser. So these bits here. Uh, show lots of clustering, um, whereas um, the non-biological bits here and there, they don't really um, show that. Um, so we did a similar thing for the shell and the interior and the exterior. And yeah, in almost all cases, the biological bits showed a lot of clustering in these particular elements. And so I'm just saying that we could use a suite of elements to look for signs of, of life. This was just a test sample to see what this, you know, this weird structure in here um, was like. And uh, so we did a lot of maps, um, collected the data and, um, and yeah, so it showed, um, so this little bit here showed the obviously maximum clustering. Uh, F uh, also shows clustering, but not as much as this middle portion here. So it's just another way of basically saying, well, can we, can we use geochemistry in a, in a different way, apart, along with textures and other things? Lots of challenges, lots of challenges. Whatever I've told you, you know, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Like I said, 99.999% of microbial species are yet to be discovered. We don't understand how many species of life forms there are on Earth. And microbial life forms, that's so crucial towards whether it's autogenic mineralization, permineralization, fossilization, and preservation. 
they are so important in all four of those uh, processes. And this is the microbial diversity compared to animal and plant diversity. And how significant is that? Um, it's pretty incredible when you think about it, that there's so much that we just don't know. We just don't know. And we have to, you know, one has to devote their entire lifetimes and probably their students and their students to come to level. Like this is the sort of numbers we're talking about. So it's not, there's a lot to be discovered. So what we know is based on currently available data and there's a lot to be done. The various geo strategies, we're only still learning about it. Uh, some microorganisms prefer aragonite over calcite. Um, some microorganisms prefer goetite over hematite. Some microorganisms will have calcite and hydrocerucite and hematite. Hydrocerucite, it's got lead in it. Now, lead is normally toxic. The only reason why they have hydrocerucite is to prevent, from, uh, pre prevent the microbial colony from predation. So microorganisms use a wide variety of geo strategies and we're not actually totally aware of all of them. And so we don't even know what some of the mineralization is for, uh, whether it's for protection purposes, some sort of function, but we don't know all of them. Um, there's this thing called quorum sensing, which is what I've got a very simplified description here because this is again beyond my purview of science. I'm a geologist, not a biologist, but we have to be mindful when we're looking for signs of life in our rocks um, that there's this thing called quorum sensors where there is uh, cell signaling pathways between, between organisms that they can use to track uh, whether they're running low on a particular element or not. If yes, then they start concentrating it within the cells. If there's too much of a particular element around them, then they start releasing because they don't want the element concentration to be too high, otherwise it'll get toxic for them. Um, they realize uh, where they are, their positioning. So the magnetotactic bacteria, the reason where they have the ma um, magnetite crystals aligned is for geopositioning. Um, and these, um, cell signaling pathways will again determine what element is being um, sourced from the water column inside them what what what's being released so there's that's very complex um and every that's just quorum signal or uh, sensing for bacteria um archaea will have different and eukaryotes will have a whole different range of cell signaling pathways how does that affect our geochemistry and oxygenic mineralization, it's again, a big, big question. I mean, we've just recovered microbes that have survived 100 million years beneath the seafloor. This was uh, um, retrieved from uh, an IODP exploration where these microbes were, you know, were pretty much dead, surviving on very little um, energy, very nutrient poor conditions. But once they, um, they were revived in the lab when the scientists um, collected the core. Uh, so that's the sort of level of understanding that we're just starting to get about how life actually operates. So to, to be able to define life and find signs of it is a, is a long way. Uh, here's the, the timeline again. And bulk of our evolution occurs here um, in this, you know, first sort of 500 million years, well, all the macro life, this is where it's all um, concentrating anyway. All of this is super macro. Um, and so how is that signature preserved in our rocks? We don't necessarily understand. This we do understand very well because of its macroscopic nature simply. Um, but we are slowly finding, we're collecting data um, every now and then. And, you know, that's improving our understanding. But there's more to be, you know, understood because initially I remember being taught that 540 um, was the pre-Cambrian, Cambrian boundary was when life evolved. And now we know life's evolved much before that. And in fact, much more complex life. So maybe we spent a lot of time, didn't even bother looking for um, signs of life. But as new data becomes available, you know, we change our, our research narrative and uh, we try and explore uh, where we've never explored before. So that uh, that is also going to be very important. Um, 
how has um, the geochemistry of our oceans changed? Like, for instance, this um, lines at all have uh, produced a series of geochemical um, signatures, chromium isotopes, molybdenum, uh, uranium, zinc, you name it, um, iodine and all kinds of things, right? Um, and the, the contention is that, oh, nothing happened un until we reach after the boring billion and things happen. So, you know, if we're, we're to look for life, you should be looking at here because things must have happened here. But we know that that's not true. Uh, lots of um, um, evolutionary breakthroughs occurred. I mean, my own research has shown that some of these flat lines are probably not right. Um, we just need a most sensitive technique to be able to resolve some of the fluctuations. But because our understanding of the geochemistry of our early Earth is changing so rapidly, I think we will be exploring more um, and, you know, we'll dare to explore more in regions where we have not explained before oxygen. There's been so much emphasis on oxygen. And this is a graph in 2014. This is the one in 2021. Look, there are a couple of bumps here and there. And so our understanding of redox is changing. We now know that a lot of organisms don't even require oxygen. And some can survive and next to no oxygen. Sometimes they produce oxygen rather than use them. So our understanding of how life operates under different geochemical conditions is also changing. So in other words, our understanding of evolution of life is also evolving. Uh, just a very brief description on how our understanding of metazoans or animal life has evolved. As more techniques have come available, you know, first we just focused on cellular and morphological features. In the molecular and phylogenomics era, we started focusing on DNA sequencing techniques because we had the means to do it. Um, and so on and so forth. It's evolved a lot. Um, people think uh, uh, metazoans didn't evolve until after the Cambrian. Then it was the Ediacaran fossils were discovered and, you know, it was wonderful. Um, and then, of course, there's now questions of deep divergence time based on molecular clocks. Not so long ago, really, this, this year, there's been that the first fossil for animals is probably, you know, much earlier um, than 800 even. So close to 900 million years old. So it's we're only just beginning to uncover um, really lots of information. And I think in the coming years, there'll be more. Uh, so we need to be ready. Um, so I should be ready, for instance, to completely reimagine my geochemical um, biogenicity tool as more data becomes available. So yeah, but they're, they're just some key points. And of course, as soon as you try and break the, I know that from experience, um, what, once you try and uh, come up with a new idea, um, especially if it's sort of discarding some really popular ideas that you get a lot of backlash. It's very prevalent in the in, in our community anyway. So there's there's going to be a lot of that as well as more data becomes available. Um, like I said, trace fossils, we don't trace fossils aren't there until um, 500 um, million years. But this is a, another paper that's a claim that it probably we had motility 2.1 billion years ago. So our information is changing. And I showed this graph to you earlier on about amount of decay and microbial activity. I think additionally to what I've done, we will also, also need to look at some isotopic variations. We also need to look at speciation, just looking at abundances or whether it's clustering or not probably isn't enough. Perhaps, perhaps we could look at speciation. Perhaps we could see that uh, a certain ionic form of a particular element is uh, absorbed on, on the biological part, or perhaps we could see a, you know, a very um, heterogeneous uh, sort of um, speciation within the biological areas um, versus the non bio I don't, I don't know. I'm going to have applied for a few proposals myself to look at these things myself uh, using uh, uh, synchrotron facilities um, to see if that can give me some answer. And then this amazing and rather fascinating concept of order versus organization. You know, when um, What Is Life book uh, came out in 1944, it was suggested that life has this some sort of order. Um, but now that concept has changed and, you know, a crystal is ordered, but a biological 
organism is more organized. So um, a, a crystal is more ordered, but a, a, a biological cell is more organized. So there are these really fascinating, rather more, you know, a bit, a bit more philosophical as well, because then you've got to add the word consciousness to life. Yeah. We, we don't even go there. We don't, none of us at least talks about consciousness. Um, what does that mean when 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 it comes to life? So there's lots of questions still to be answered, but um, but the the challenge is obviously on. Um, I think this is my last slide. But what I would like you all to do is to get your phones out if you can, and just go to the website. You can scan the QR code on my uh, screen, or you just go to your phone on your web browser and type in slido.com and then punch in the punch in the code and i'd like you to just answer hopefully if you do then we should be able to see the results uh on screen right now if you don't mind doing that um not sure how many of you will get access to it um hopefully the link is still active if not we can just move to the to the question and answers but if you can then i'll just leave the screen on for now oh my god we've just had one poll so far so if we can have more polls that would be really good oh there's two I think um, if you are viewing this on YouTube, you should still be able to uh, take the poll. me if you want uh we could, i could just leave that slide on and um uh, people can just uh fill in the their information as we go but we don't have to wait we could just keep having a a conversation or a, or a q a yeah uh, so first i would like to mention it was a great talk i thoroughly enjoyed it mm -hmm. and i'm sure other other participants have also really liked it uh, there are a lot of there were a lot of new information we which we were not really aware of so it's like uh, a very new thing to have so uh, also i would like to like uh, thank dr sandeep roy from uh, like uh, a renowned petroleum geologist uh, so uh, i would first like to thank him for attending the session and uh, i would like to offer him the mic like if he would have something to say or ask some questions Oh, yes. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. you know, that was a fantastic talk. Thank you, you know, so much. It uh, raised my level of thinking very much. Oh, thank you. And, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I've elevated myself after this talk. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, let me be, be very childish and ask you a couple of questions. Please. Uh, I mean, uh, as a layman, I'm trying to understand whether there could be possibly more GOEs uh, before the GOE one, which we have still not detected. That's first question. Second question is, can we imagine or assume that life started much earlier than what we know about from the biogeo signatures till date? And the last question is, have some signatures of earlier life 
could have been destroyed, which will we will never be able to detect. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic questions. Um, to go with your first question, whether we had uh, GOE, GOEs before the first great oxidation, absolutely. I don't, and I don't, I refuse to believe that there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. So the current G GOE is at 2.33 billion years old based on um, sulfur ma mass independent fractionation. That's the, the most reliable record that the geological community wants to believe. But think about it, like you can't just suddenly accumulate that level of oxygen at this one point in Earth's history. So there's obviously, there's had to be, there's had to be a build up. I mean, if you look at even simple things like black shale lithology, why, why do we have black shales on the first place? Because it's organic matter rich shale. Organic matter rich shale would imply that there was organic matter uh, burial. And we know that organic carbon burial will release oxygen. We know that there's, there've been stromatolites throughout Earth's history. I think what happens versus what gets manifested in the rock record, um, they're two different things. And so it is quite possible that they were, you know, you know, widespread oxygenation, but it wasn't being necessarily being manifested in the in the rock record. Um, but they were in, in some way or the other. So if we've looked at, we've actually published a paper ourselves about that the GOE is not a sharp event, but it's a, it's a gradual increase. And if you speak to um, some uh, geologists who are on the, on the opinion, of the opinion that oxygenation was actually quite widespread in the Archean as well, um, uh, they would tell you that it, it may not have been pronounced enough to be recorded uh, in the rock in the rock record, but it was still there. You, you can't say there was no oxygen. That's just not a scenario. So I I agree with you. It is quite possible that there may be more uh, of oxygenation events that, than we think. Then coming to your next questions, um, whether that means that you know maybe life forms started much earlier. Um, and we could have detected uh, them. Uh, everyone is in a rush these days to be the first one to come up with the oldest evidence of life. So you'll, you know, we'll do anything to be that person. Um, there's this real urge to be, oh, but I discovered the oldest life form. And so we, we are getting there. We're seeing that we are pushing it back and back and back. Um, but did it start much earlier? Uh, you know, I've realized one thing that the, the capacity of life um, to adapt and change, and, and that's what they've done on Earth since 4.56 billion years. You know, no matter what the conditions were, life survived. So I believe that, you know, it, it could, as long as the ingredients are there and the, so this, we're talking about evolution origins of life is a totally different topic that I am very scared to even touch upon. But say life has originated. Once it's originated, I think life on Earth, at least its capacity to exist would be would be, you know, tremendous. So I would not be surprised if if we find signs of life earlier than we already have, because it's just the that innate nature of life to survive once it's originated. And your third question, have signatures of earliest life been destroyed that we would, you know, absolutely. I think that I don't actually have any doubts in saying that that might have been the case. Um, it's amazing, though, whatever is being preserved when you think about it. Like, as geologists, we talk about, oh, billions of years, millions of years. I remember attending a workshop with, you know, non-geologists and they they had a look at my rock and I was like, oh, this is a stromatolite from the MacArthur Basin. It's 1.6 billion years old. And they were like, billion years, they can't comprehend. And so when you think about it, really, it's a really long time uh, to have been preserved. So that's what's being preserved. Imagine all the stuff we've lost. So I, I think we probably have lost quite a bit. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much for your questions. Really appreciate it. 
So anyone else would like to have a question? So uh, you can type the questions in the chat. I can read it out. Or even in YouTube, uh, you can comment and I can read the questions out loud. And I would take this opportunity to ask some questions of my own because I, I don't see any questions in the chat box currently. And if somebody wants to ask the question live, they can mention in the chat box. I can call them out or they can raise their hands. So, uh, so uh, as I can already see this uh, poll on your uh, like that you are conducting. So, uh, it obviously it signifies that it's based on diversity in geosciences. So, uh, what is your take on it, or what is your stand? Well, we've how? just had twelve. Um, I I hope more people um could take the take the poll that way. I would have sort of gauged how many, uh, so what what the diversity of this, you know, this session is like, for instance. But um, not for the session, like uh, overall. Oh, do you just have in a, general. Yeah, it's pretty poor. I think. Um, I don't think there's anyone. Uh, there's no scarcity of encouragement until the undergrad level. You know, I, I didn't feel like girls weren't encouraged to do geology or anything. I didn't feel that at Delhi University. I didn't feel that in my boarding school we were all encouraged to do everything and my parents have always encouraged me to do to do well I, I don't think that's where the barriers come in the barriers come in at the higher degree level uh, and i would say after undergraduation that's when the pressures on women are higher uh, than um, men and it's it it's does not matter where you are whether you're in india whether you are in australia where you, whether you are in the US, there's some sort of societal pressure pressures on on women, and you also see a lot of dropouts because they can't see themselves. You can't be what you can't see. Um, we had one female teacher in Delhi University. Um, all I was always taught by our male teachers. Um, we have to we have to ask ourselves why. Um, because we're not tapping the 50, the talent in the 50%. That's probably because they didn't even bother interviewing for the position or whatever, but we have to question why that's happening. So there is a bottleneck at some point, and I personally think it's, um, it's uh, after the undergraduation level. So if we can encourage our young girls, not at the cost of discouraging young boys, I want to be very clear, I have nothing against men. Like I said, my mentors are uh, uh, men. I've, I've married a man, so clearly. So I don't have anything against men. It's just um, what I what I actually mean is that we don't see the numbers that we should be seeing. And it's important we do see those numbers. Yeah, true. Uh, so uh, and one question is in the chat box. I'll read it out. Do you think we have lost more than 50% early life traces from being preserved? And you know, only, and we know only about 0.001% about it. So it's Samia Khan. Yeah, thank you, Samia, for your for your question. Look, to say uh, we've lost more than 50%, I, I'm very reticent to put a, put a number, but I, I think we might have lost um, a lot of information, but maybe we just don't know yet um we actually we are still in the process of discovering so it's like we're scanning our sedimentary rock records towards history and that that process is a long process um and it takes time so it's very hard to answer the question it's a very good question but i think the 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 um what i would like would be to to understand and uncover more information i think it's too early to say how much we've lost because we don't know what the total amount is for a fact and frankly i don't think we will know in in my lifetime or or yours but the search should should continue uh i have a question of myself the trace element uh like uh, mapping that you did so uh on how many samples was it done like yeah so i did uh so there were uh two four three three or four samples but the samples were three or four but multiple areas of those samples were 
So are these samples of the same kind? Or like if we change the sample type, uh, will that affect the kind of trace element clustering that you see? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So I've looked at basically pyritized fossils in black shales. Uh, so in that way, they are consistent. But yeah, it, is, it would be very interesting to find out um, what it would be, for instance, a pyritized microfossil in a in a sandstone or a or, or a or a more carbonate sort of rich rock, uh, because yeah, the element uh, element associations will be different in the environment. So, um, but still, I, I was trying not to focus too much on the abundance side of things, but to see the spatial distribution of particular elements. So, perhaps the trace element uh, association will be of a different kind, but the patterns, for instance, clustering or sort of concentrating in the biological areas, those things, those patterns will be more or less uh, similar. But and I haven't tried it yet, but it's a, it's, I'll keep that in mind for my next <laughs> venture. So uh, next, are you planning to do some more experiments or like uh, some more data collections? Yes, absolutely. So like I said, I am tr trying to do some um, sulf uh, sulfur isotopes actually in situ and also uh, speciation analysis using micro uh, XRF to see if we can see some homogeneity or heterogeneity of um, element speciation. I mean, I think we're, we applied for a couple of proposals uh, to look at nickel speciation. I mean, nickel, it's just an element. I think we should just answer a lot, um, look at a lot of other elements. So um, the clustering that you did, like, uh, were the clustering made on a range of elements? Like, yeah, all of so, them. And I'm actually thinking maybe we could also do the ratios. Uh, we mm -hmm. look at the, uh, the elements in its elemental form but what about the ratios because some microbes have very specific ratio uptakes of trace elements as well so the world of microbes is absolutely fascinating so i was thinking well maybe maybe the ratios will change um and that will also look after some of the you know availability concerns of that particular element as well so uh yeah a lot of a lot of elements will need to be looked at, not just one, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I can see a lot of questions. Okay. So uh, there is a question. Uh, do you think the study has any potential to impact the research for life on other planets? Uh, yeah, absolutely. But that is a huge assumption that outside of Earth, life will be Earth-like. If that's the case, then yeah. But then the question is, which part of Earth's history are we looking for outside of Earth? Because Earth's had a 4.56 billion years of history. Are we looking like an Earth um, life form that, that we have now? Or do we want life forms that in the middle of the Proterozoic? Is that the sort of life forms we're looking at on another planet? So what part of Earth's history will we be looking for is the next question. That is assuming that life outside of Earth is Earth-like, but if it's, and which is carbon-based, but apparently they can be silicon-based as well. So if life outside of Earth is not Earth-like, then I am not, I'm not really sure how that's going to work out. But we don't know. We simply do not know. But uh, the potential of, you know, this, these studies will have potential, at least have, have the impact on at least our um, understanding of evolution of life on Earth, at least, um, because we don't know everything about Earth. So uh, uh, a follow-up question, like uh, the signals that you can see uh, on particular uh, organisms in earth like what you are studying so as you mentioned they depend on the environment they are in so if the extraterrestrial uh, like uh, outside planets if they have a different kind of environment then the signals would differ in them as well right absolutely um absolutely there's uh like i said it's it's what it's what's being decayed it's 
who's causing the decay, um, how many different species of microbial decay is occurring, what minerals are available during the decay is occurring, um, what is being decayed in terms of what, what are the taxonomic controls? Is, this, is it a soft body part, uh, a hard body part, is it? So there's like a plethora of things. Um, and we're just beginning to sort of unravel. It's, it's, it's incredibly complex. So you're right. And, and that's an environment that you and I are familiar with because we understand uh, what well, we at least, you know, we claim to understand geological environments. Now, th th that is on Earth. So what, the ge what kind of geo environment would be in uh, the other planet will obviously determine their uh, well, formation and preservation. So Samia has a, a like a follow up addition. So ma'am, I want to add that me know there have been lots of ups and downs in our geologic history that may have erased a lot. Have some lights on my thought. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, plate tectonics, uh, of course. You know, how old is the? How, what is the oldest oceanic crust? Well, so, so so much is being destroyed. A hundred percent. There's no no doubt of in my mind that a lot has been lost. But uh, my point is, as, as we go further back in time, the, the evidence gets more and more obscure. Because uh, if something is recent versus if something is much, much older, chances of finding life is, is, is it gets tougher, because it's been there, out there being weathered for a lot longer than something that's formed relatively younger. So yeah, you're right, there's been lots of ups and downs, but you know, uh, we have to work with what we have, so. So uh, another question, uh, what do we need all these ratings for? What do we intend to create out of them, impact? So these datings as in, um, not, not sure I understand what the datings comment mean. Does that mean, the geological, uh, the geochemistry data? Is that what is being implied here? I think the you said that you would uh, try to do some isotopes or something, uh, but I don't think those oh, isotopes I, are dating. I don't know. Yeah, I wasn't trying to yeah. date anything yeah. as such. But yeah, the geochemical data, the impact of it would be to understand um, how we can understand evolution of life on Earth and uh, whether we can come up with a maybe, it just may be that there is just one code for life. Um, I mean, one day we will be able to have a, a you know, mathematical equation perhaps to signify what life is. Uh, maybe there is just one, um, one equation for life. Maybe it can be quantified and uh, so the geochemical data, I mean, when we, I mean, we already have crazy AI going on in this world right now. And uh, with Urmi doing machine learning, maybe you'll come up with a technique of using tons of geochemical data and quantifying life. And maybe there's just one signature of life, regardless of where you are on the planet. So, um, yeah, if so be it. But uh, I, I suppose that'll be a while. And while that's happening, I might as well start the process of creating the the geochemical database that can be used by the future generation or AI. <laughs> so uh, another question from YouTube. Do you think that the approach to hunt for biosignatures on other planets like Mars is similar to that of Earth? No, no, they, they, they've they got you. Know, obviously, they've got the best of brains. They're not that naive. But a lot of it is Earth-based, but I think they you know, their search is a lot more nuanced and now, uh, uh, you know, we have to do the best we can. And uh, it's obviously based on Earth, but they will obviously take into account a lot of different factors um, as well. So it's not purely just, just based on Earth. So do you think the approach to hunt for bicycle? Yeah, so it, it's similar, but not entirely, I don't think. Uh, do you have do we have any other questions? Um, so I guess the poll is of fourteen people that you can see. 
but even if it's 14 people it's if it's 50 50 I'll, 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 um, i'm happy yeah. oh there's another question yeah 80 to 90 percent of organisms were wiped out at the end of the great oxidation event right ma'am uh, well it depends on on what organisms we're talking about so i think uh, it will probably i think you're referring to i've heard of this um i don't know if i necessarily believe that and i only say it because if you look at like and i gave that uh, example before if you look at the um proportion of black shale units in a, in a stratigraphy through time and there's a seminal paper by condi actually can't remember the years 1990 i can't remember but he's done a, a paper on black shales uh, uh, through earth's history so it gives you an idea of the proportion of black shale units within the stratigraphy through time and that's pretty massive regardless it's gone up and down but this is significant proportions of stratigraphic units are black shales how will you form black shales if you've killed 80 to 90 percent of organic matter like how will you form? Because to have the black shells to a continue, yes, if there was a huge hiatus, then yes, maybe you're, you're right that organisms uh, disappeared. But I don't think you see that hiatus at any point in Earth's history uh, since, um, which is the oldest black shells, I don't know, 3.7 or something. But you don't see any hiatus in the, uh, after the great oxidation event. If there was a massive kill off, then there shouldn't be any organic matter. Um, well, there shouldn't be any biological um, activity. So no organic matter. So no organic matter means no organic matter preservation. Then why are the black shells so organic matter rich? So perhaps not. Uh, in fact, after the great oxidation, fabulous things happened, uh, including the evolution of very complex life. I do think that um, the first pronounced oxygenation of the Earth's atmosphere had some serious impacts on microorganisms in terms of forming um, the, the called, um, reactive um, oxygen species, ROS. And they're very, very harmful to the to cellular functions because elements that are normally available for chemical reactions for the cell, uh, um, that was suddenly being oxidized and not being available. So um, that was a negative impact on organisms, but their organisms, especially microbes, they're pretty smart. Um, I've just seen a question come up. Uh, I think evolution was delayed. I absolutely disagree with that. Um, evolution was not delayed. And if you'll have me again, I'll, I can give you another whole lecture on why evolution actually took off instead of evolution being delayed after the great oxidation event. So uh, that's that's not, um, I'm going to refute that with all the passion I've got. Okay, so I think it has been a very interactive session. And uh, okay, uh, we have another question. Uh, Till now, we easily identify different microbiological and physiochemical structures by observing texture, but it is true, as you say, it can be mistaken. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I agree with you. I mean, you basically, um, this is what I was saying to you earlier that um, in some instances when the fossils have been studied, you know, very much so and for years, you know, trilobites, for instance, my God, the amount of information that we have on trilobites, how much information do we have on I don't know, Proterozoic Acritax or Eukaryotic protists from, uh, or even bacteria from Archean. How much, how much evidence or studies do we have? Not a lot, but dinosaurs, heaps, because a lot of interest, a lot of traction, a lot of research, growing body of data. But other things where it's so scant, um, a immediately and the micro nature that's right the micro nature of these things are also you know we tend to get very attracted oh big dinosaurs this and that there's news every single time there's a dinosaur found i'm so sick of it like what about the microbes 
microbes are so important like there's more microbes on your face right now than there's people in india and china microbes dominate the world they dominated the world back in time they dominate the world today i think we all know that and they will dominate in the future when we're long gone so uh, it's important we take those uh, little guys seriously uh, based on proterozoic life from signatures, can we reconstruct any extinction events that may have not been documented in complex rock records? Yeah, I mean, we never talk about micros, microorganisms extinctions. We don't even know about it. So yeah, absolutely. And uh, since life prior to Ediacaran, um, Ediacaran was mainly excuse me, um, microscopic, uh, they will have been. But just like, just like any other extinction events that we've had in Earth's history, every extinction event is followed by huge diversity. So I am 100% sure that's happened with the microbial life forms as well. It's just that we can't document. Do you know, though, um, there was a fantastic Goldschmidt presentation one time by York and Brooks where we we use these biomarkers called sterines to say which uh, fossils, uh, which organic matter was derived from a eukaryotic source versus prokaryotic source. Um, but it turns out that um, the, 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 the enzymes that are used by the different organisms have had significant changes in their chemistry. So um, even though if something looks like it was not there, um, they were actually looking at the wrong thing apparently. And so, uh, not the wrong thing, but they were ignoring this um, uh, other critical information that they were collecting in their organic compounds. So there's a huge diversity now that they can see. I mean, yes, it's not stirring, but it's a different kind of uh, compound, uh, which was initially being sort of uh, uh, not recognized or un going unnoticed. But now they realize that because that um, enzymatic pathways have changed, Thing. it said something along the lines of that and so because the enzymes their compositions have changed the organic compounds or the signatures were different so they were look the signature was there they were just not looking for that one and looking for something else but now they realize what they've done and when they look at it you realize there's a huge diversity so if we started doing that we probably will find extinction events um, it would be pretty hard though for microbial life forms but yeah lots been uh there's lots there just waiting to be discovered let's put it that way yeah so uh it has been i think we have already uh, crossed the time limit for this session so uh i guess if anyone has further question they can dire directly email you uh and uh, absolutely yeah. i would be very happy to address questions so yeah, it was a very interactive session and uh, I am sure everyone enjoyed the talk you gave. Uh, so I would like to thank you from uh, the whole of our team and uh, thank you for like uh, give, giving this uh, great talk. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and letting me share my research with you all. It's been very good. Thank you. Thank you all for attending the session. <laughs>